Many of us are thinking ahead in the EPQ to the presentation and to the kind of images that you will use in your public presentation that will have the most impact. I'm beginning this screencast entitled The Power of the Visual with one of the most powerful photographs that I can think of. And I'm going to use this photograph to show you how important it is to think about diagrams, pictures, cartoons, etc. in the body of your EPQ report. This is one of the photos that maybe changed the course of history. In it, we see a naked girl whose back is on fire. She's been bombed with napalm. In the background are the figures of anonymous American soldiers. And it is a photo that is absolutely, truly devastating. A photo that helped change American public opinion and sway them against the war in Southeast Asia that they had become involved in. Later, Kim Tai, as her name is, moved to Canada where she wrote an incredible book called Fire Road based on her childhood memories. As you can see from the photo, her body never recovered from the scars of napalm, but it's a beautiful story about coming to terms with childhood trauma. And I chose this photo, as I said, to show you how the old cliche goes, that a picture is worth a thousand words. So as I say, the main purpose of the screencast will be to get you to think about the images that you may choose to use in your written report. So what am I going to cover? I'm going to look at the idea of a picture's worth a thousand words. I'm going to look at when to use a figure in your um, written report. I'm going to show you how to do a list of figures. I'm going to talk about the value of tables and graphs. I'm going to show you how to lay out a figure and how to include a citation. Because if you use a picture, you need to reference it in the same way that you would use a critic. I'm going to show you how infographics can be extremely uh, useful in terms of condensing meaning. I'm going to also show you that diagrams are very valuable in terms of the construction process, especially for reports to do with, the, uh, with artifacts. And I'm going to talk to you about the different kinds of visuals that you can use in a variety of subject areas. Well, let's get started. Using visuals in your report, some of the things that you need to think about very carefully are referencing it properly, exploring the figure in detail in your report. It shouldn't simply be a piece of decoration. It should aid meaning. You can consider using your own arrows and labeling techniques to make the diagram or figure more lucid. You can use these figures to illustrate a complex process. You could even design your own flow charts or process charts or find these. The key idea is to use these to illustrate highly technical processes. So if you're doing a science report or a medical report or something in mathematics or physics, visuals often offer an alternative way of illustrating these highly technical processes. Also, numerical data can be extremely useful. Those of you doing your own research or primary research will be thinking of bar charts and how you are going to visualize the data that you discovered. Now, there are three important questions to consider. Does the visual add anything useful? So any image or chart included in the work should help your argument or explain a, a, a point more clearly. Is the image carefully labeled? Have you put a caption in it? Okay. Have you made it clear why it's there? As I said earlier, the worst thing to do is to use it simply as decoration. It should be intrinsic to the explanation, the argument, etc. Make sure that you mention it in the text. You need to label each of your figures, figure one point to etc etc now um, in the beginning of your written report in the epq you will have a table of contents and the table of contents will show the different headings and subheadings underneath that you can also have a list of figures as you see here 
And I would recommend strongly that you do this in table form, just as you would with a table of contents. This helps to orientate the reader and helps them find the figures when they are in a hurry. Now here's an example of a figure that is properly cited using the APA formatting. In our college, we sometimes teach the APA formatting. We also use Harvard and sometimes Oxford. So you'll see here is the uh, bar chart that we're using. It's called Figure 1 and it has a title in italics, Degree in Modern Art in the United States. Underneath it, you may wish to caption it with a note. If you do so, the APA format asks you to use italics, followed by a period, a, a full stop, uh, with a description of the figure. So that is a very well-referenced figure that shows exactly what it's doing there and helps the reader understand what function it has within the report. Now, if you're using the Harvard system, don't forget that you're going to need to reference it properly. And in order to do that, if it's a photograph, you're going to need the photographer, the year of publication, the title of the photograph in italics, where it's available, so the URL. And if you're using it in the body of your work as an in-text citation, then you would simply, following the Harvard system, use the author name and the date of publication. When it's in the references, which are at the end, then you will put in all the information that I've gone through above, making it a full citation. Now, many of you will be using quite a lot of data, particularly if you're you know, doing an EPQ in economics or business or psychology, anywhere where there's a lot of stats and data, it's very important how you present that data. Now, you know that if you write a paragraph that is just filled with many different forms of numbers, this is often hard to follow. And it may be that you want to use a really good figure, a bar chart, a scatter graph, or whatever, to illustrate the process. As I said earlier, you may, cho you may choose to put an arrow on this. The key thing is to make sure that that data is then explored within your writing. Now I said that I was going to cover the idea of the artifact and if you're doing an artifact then you need to use many figures and in particular figures that illustrate the process of construction. This is an EPQ of a motorbike reconstruction done by one of our students and this particular student did a whole book with 120 pages showing the reconditioning of a Ducati motorcycle and all of his skills acquisitions and he carefully charts the progress of it. So it's extremely important within an artifact report that you use a kind of construction uh, process like this and of course you'd also want to do that when you give your artifact presentation to the public. Here's another example of a student who used a kit to make a quadcopter. And you can see how powerful it is when you show the process of construction. And of course, this would be accompanied by lots of text. You could also label the diagrams and show how you're problem solving and how you are basically testing designs, etc. So the figure is absolutely essential in these reports in order to show the process and the development of your artifact. Mind mapping is another form of figure that you may wish to include both in your presentations, but also in your artifact report. A mind map often shows your initial ideas and your desire to organize and categorize these. So if you are including a mind map in your artifact report, Please write about it. Don't imagine that the reader will simply look at the mind map and see its significance. Write something about it. Draw your reader's attention to how it was in va of value and what part it played within the evolution of your project and the success of your artifact. Now, I want to make the point that I hate IKEA furniture with a passion, but we all know 
that one of the good things about IKEA furniture is it usually comes with a kind of manual that illustrates for us graphically, allows us to visualize all of the different processes that we need to go through to make this hideous bed that we have in a box. And I'm using this to remind you that so often graphic visualization beats highly technical words. All you have to do is ask somebody directions and then get them to draw a map to see how the visual map makes those directions so much easier to process on a cognitive level. So what do we learn from this? Well, we learn when you're writing your EPQ report, if you find that your uh, descriptions are extremely dense and technical, I would strongly urge you to find some kind of visualization of that process, or if you want to be very ambitious, to create it yourself. Now, one particular one that's quite easy to create is a process chart. You can find these uh, templates on the internet all over the place. And if in the middle of your argument you are trying to illustrate something, how, for instance, poverty is related to high rates of crime, a process chart can sometimes be very valuable as long as the process is quite linear, as we see here, straightforward. In this case, it's a straightforward circle. However, it's often the case that that won't be the right graphic to illustrate your argument. There are many different uh, uh, templates available for you. So we've seen a linear one, but you can also do branch diagrams. This is where there are different choices. If this happens, then go here, etc. Now, I'm a philosophy teacher, and I use branch diagrams all of the time to illustrate diff difficult philosophical arguments because it allows the reader to follow the logic of the argument without too many words. And as I say here, there's great software. Why not think about making your own process chart or branch diagram when you feel that your descriptions are extremely technical? Now, when you do a very difficult science report, in my college, many of the students do medical EPQs. I think we had 12 of these last year. You will know that when you're reading a highly technical page, it is such a sense of relief when you encounter a diagram that translates the words into graphics. And I would strongly suggest that you use arrows or other mechanisms to draw the reader's attention to particular things. I would say, don't make the diagrams too technical. I've chosen this one because I think it's about the right amount of information. Also within medical EPQs, slides of, of disease cells, etc. These can be so valuable in visualizing what it is that you're writing about, particularly if you're writing about disease or particular problems of the body. Now, as someone who's had two ACL reconstruction uh, operations, this diagram always fills me with pain. But it's just an illustration that if you're talking about something like an injury, how useful it is to have a diagram so that people can actually visualize where the injury is. And of course, then you would label it, figure three, for instance, and you would be able to refer to it and say, you can see in the middle of the diagram where the cruciate ligament is torn, etc. Once again, you may choose to use arrows, etc., to indicate that. So in terms of science, as well as history or the media, a picture is worth a thousand words. The New York Times goes as far as to say a picture is worth 10,000 words. So for technical people, think very carefully about using these technical diagrams and making sure that you embed them within your descriptions and your analysis. Now, infographics are an amazing way of illustrating information. And you can often find these on the internet. You can use them in your presentation or your report. Or you could be even more ambitious, and you could make your own infographic. It's a wonderful way, as I say here, of visualizing and condensing data. Sometimes a really good figure can get to the actual core of your argument, okay? 
So as I've said to you, they illustrate data, they simplify complex information, they allow the comparison of different things, they raise awareness. They're also very important about drawing your attention to things like size and scale, and that's what I'll show you next. Here's an infographic of debt in the world, and so if you wanted to immediately visualize which countries are, are struggled with the most debt, we see here the United States and Japan. This infographic makes the size relative to the debt, so immediately it allows somebody to visualize which are the greatest debtor countries. A little bit worrying there to see the UK also quite large with 3.5% of the world's debt. Altogether, there have been $69 trillion of debt. So the infographic has real power. It's very effective in a presentation, but as I say, it can also be embedded into the report, providing you discuss it within that report. Here's a picture of the Beatles. I'm including that because the next infographic is absolutely superb, and some of you may have forgotten what a great band they are. This is a particular infographic, and I've only taken a screenshot of it. I think it's an amazing one. And if you want to see the whole thing, then just please follow this particular link here. Um, I would stop the screencast now and have a look at it, just to see how rich an infographic can be. And in this particular one, what they've done is they've taken the years of 1964 to 1970 of the Beatles, and they've shown which particular one of the artists wrote the songs. And it's very valuable and interesting because it gives you a sense of who were the real creative powers in the Beatles. And you can see here that it's a combination mainly of John Lennon and Paul McCartney. Uh, and Ringo Starr seems to have missed out a bit. So the great value of this infographic is it quickly illustrates a point about the frequency of creative input. Pictures tell a story, as I say. They often illustrate things like ideology, like pain. The picture of the Vietnam War that I showed you is so evocative and shows the atrocities that were committed against the civilian uh, population. I would have a look at this picture here and decide what you think is happening and stop the screencast now. Now, if you've had a look at it, you will realize that this is a mother turning away in shame. She's been photographed here reluctantly, and there's a sign to sell her children. What could be a more poignant representation of despair and desperation than this particular woman? And if I wanted to illustrate despair during the Depression, and the absolutely terrible lengths that people needed to go to to survive, then perhaps this photo would be of great value indeed. And if I was writing about this in my report, it would be a good device to embed this within my argument to illustrate my points. Another picture which is extremely famous um, to illustrate a particular story is the one before you. Once again, I'd urge you to stop the screencast now and to think a little bit about this. Photo is entitled Toffs and Tufts. It's taken outside the cricket ground, the Lord's Cricket Ground in 1937 taken by a brilliant journalist called Jimmy Stein, and it appeared in the newspaper, it appeared at a newspaper called the News Chronicle, which was a left-wing newspaper at the time. Under the headline, every picture tells a story, and indeed this one did. These two boys were both pupils of Harrow School, the elite British private school. These other boys, it turned out had uh, truanted from school that day and had gone to the cricket ground to try and make some money by carrying people's parcels. It's a photo that is famous or infamous because it seems to show the gulf that exists between different social classes. I think what makes it so classic is the expressions of the two Harrow boys who seem so disdainful gazing into the distance 
and the kind of amusement of the working class boys looking at them. It seemed to say so much about the class divide in Britain, one that I think and I fear that hasn't changed too much. Moving on, if you're writing history or political essays, cartoons have been a wonderful, amazing and creative response to different historical events over the ages. I could have chosen so many, but once again, these kind of visuals can have great impact. Here we have Hitler saying, Germany shall never be encircled. And here he is grasping the world. A powerful cartoon that illustrates the perceived ambition and the rapaciousness of Hitler's Germany. Now, if you're writing about films or plays, it's an extremely good idea to perhaps take some screenshots, some screen grabs of absolute key moments. This is a classic film, The Deer Hunter, a film about Vietnam. It's one of Robert De Niro's finest performances in my eyes. And in this particular case, I've chosen the still because it says so much. You can be seen that he is being forced to play Russian roulette to see if there's a bullet in that gun that's going to blow his head off. Here we see the rifle butt of the Viet Cong soldier forcing him to do it. In the background, in the center, is a picture of Ho Chi Minh, who's the leader of the communist uh, movement, rebellion in Viet Cong. The bamboo hut, it says so much. Such an incredible still that illustrates the mise-en-scene of the film. And what better technique if you were writing and trying to capture the visual world of film than to include visuality? And this equally applies to if you're writing about painters, if you're uh, writing about artists or sculptors. Your essay should certainly be embedded with key visuals. But remember the golden rule would be to use arrows, to explore it closely in the essay, and to zoom in on specific details so that that picture really works for you and helps your analysis. So in conclusion, a picture is worth a thousand words, perhaps even 10,000 words. Visualization of complex procedures is absolutely necessary. If you do not find the diagrams you seek, consider making them. That seems to me an incredibly creative thing for an EPQ person to do. If you don't use it in your report, you can use it in your presentation. If it's vital, you could use it in both. Please remember the importance of captions and referencing. You need to make the visuals central to your discussion. You need to make them work within the report. Remember, visualization helps cognition and understanding. Good luck in your reports and think very carefully about which visuals you're going to use. Thank you for listening.